1 Peter 3.15 is a verse that leans us into that. It says, in your hearts, revere or consecrate Christ as Lord. Was the, the word Lord there is really intentional. Not Christ as best friend or the Alpha and the Omega, the bright and morning star. I love all those names. But in this context, Lord is important, meaning leader, meaning the God that decides. We talk here often about making Jesus. Who? Jesus. Who? Jesus. <laughs> Putting Jesus at the decision-making center of your soul. Every decision is his to make. And the very first series uh, when we launched was built and based on that and our relationship with him. But it was titled Better Together. That was our first series at 828 Church. For some of you who were around, you remember that. And it was, it was 2015, right? It was already a little bit cliche, but it caught more momentum after that. But I say often, things often are cliche because they're incredibly true. We say them a lot because they're accurate, right? It's not always the case. But in this case, it is the case. We really are better together. But and in that first week, I know I watched this message a couple of days ago. I watched the message from our very first week. And, and in that first message, I made the point, not everything's better together. I say that around here sometimes, right? That is, I don't know, any surfers in the house? Yeah. No? Yeah. I got a few hands popping up. Y'all shy. Surfers are shy? I didn't know that. I didn't even know surfers were shy. Well, there you go. I figured, there you go. Coming up slowly. Yeah, that's me. Maybe these people all fall off their board and they just feel bad about saying they're surfers. Well, you've tried. Hallelujah. Good job. Surfing, I'm sure, is good with a buddy and a board, but not with a great white shark. My point, not everything's better together or hiking or camping with a Kodiak grizzly, not better together, right, right, you with me? When I was a kid, my dad convinced me, and this was my experience, but we lived near a muddy little creek, river, if you will, and we used to go swim in it, and sometimes, matter of fact, we used to have baptisms down to baptizing hole, right, all right, and I've been in the baptizing hole, about to put somebody under, and there was a snake over there. <laughs> you people, you people about to get baptized, there will be no snakes in the baptistry. I, can, I feel like I can guarantee you that. And the water's clear. My dad convinced me snakes wouldn't bite you in water. So <laughs> to this day, I'm sure I would be perfectly fine swimming with snakes. That's where I'm at with it. But, you know, not every, for the most part, people don't believe that, right? Not everything is better together. We're, I'm going to say it one last time, and then I'll move on. We're not better together without God. I ain't trying to do church with you people without Jesus. I'm not even remotely interested in it. And I'm not interested in doing church that is about anyone but Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. You understand what I'm saying? Like we're going to make church about what church is about. Church is not about a what, it's about a who, and his name is Jesus. Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. But if we try to do church without Jesus, it's not much fun. I'm just saying. So that first message, the very first week's message was in the Better Together series was better together with God. And that's the way it is. Because here's why. Because the real Jesus changes people. The real Jesus, like a real relationship, Serena, with Jesus changes us. Changes everything. Like literally changes. I believe Jesus changes everything. I believe if you literally submit and surrender your heart to him and give God who you are, it will change everything. Does it make everything in life easy or good? No, of course not. Jesus said, in this life you will have trouble, but have hope or be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. Even the world's trouble is not too much for God, right? We can walk through it and still have peace and joy on our way to eternity. Thank God for eternity. One of the most amazing things about Jesus is he has dominion over death. Nobody else has that. That is only Jesus. He makes everything different. Work, business, relationships, family. Sheesh, I mean, even fun is better with God. It is. Un-God fun uh, stresses me out. <laughs> You know, I'm just like, man, I don't know, y'all. I ain't trying to go to hell for this. <laughs> so I'm probably not your party partner unless we're going party around Jesus. Just telling you, man. In the Bible, right here, every Sunday, then when we come in here, we get an opportunity to love and lead people into relationship with Jesus. 
And it's the word that does the leading, by the way. We just reading it and looking at it, unpacking it, and the perspectives in it. But it's, it's, all, it's all God. Um, and then not only love and lead people into relationship with Jesus, but into a love for his calling cause. We work on that right here because it's all about Jesus. And we're trying to listen. We are not to check church off the list, people. Right? We're the follow Jesus 24-7, 365 and 366 every four years, which I still don't understand. But I'm happy to have the extra day for the Lord, you know. But it, that's, what we're, that's what we're here for. You know, I'm, as the young people say, I'm here for it. I'm here for that. And then when someone would say, well, well, let me say this to you. We, a first takeaway, when we exclude Jesus, we set ourselves up for drama, disappointment, and ultimately disaster. That's what happens when we exclude Jesus. And I am not here for that. Okay? I'm not here for that. I don't want drama. Ugh. Or um, disappointment. We all get some of that. But then ultimately disaster. And then people will say, do you, but do you really believe that? Like even Christians will question. I mean, do you really believe that? Because I'm all about being a little bit religious. I think it's important. I do believe there's a God. But... I don't know about the way that you think about following God and that God loves us and is that active and involved in our lives and et cetera, et cetera. Do you really believe that it's all about Jesus and everything that we are in our lives? Is that just because you're a pastor? No, it's not. I'm, I mean, a pastor is a title. It's not who I am, right? I caught an assignment. You got some too, but we're all called to be sons and daughters, right? Sons or daughters, as it were. And, and the reality is... Um, I think that's the first thing we have to settle about Jesus is that Jesus is real. Jesus is real and relevant. And you say, well, what about science? Or what about, you know, science is, at this point, haven't we got enough science and enough evidence to disprove the existence of God? Or what about the Bible? I mean, that's a book full of fairy tale, right? This is the most historically supported document ever written and recorded, if you want to know the actual facts about that. But we can talk about that another day. Matter of fact, I got a series in me over here, everybody, that's going to deal with skepticism. It's upcoming. There's a, there is a forthcoming series on why God is, who God says God is, according to everything we see and know. And he don't really need our help, but, you know, he called us to be ready at all times to give a defense to the faith of the hope that lies within us. And I'll come to that in just a quick second. But the reality is um, there has been plenty of attack on faith. The atheism used to be this perspective that I don't believe in God. And somewhere in the last quarter of the last century, there was this whole new atheism. That's literally what they called it. And there are scientists who championed that, this perspective. I won't call them by name because I feel like that's rude. But those guys were out there. They weren't just unbel unbelieving. They were anti-believing. So they started to in interject into our systems, our universities and such, this perspective that believing was a, a bad thing. So it was an anti-believing perspective. Frankly, the new atheism is dying. Why? Be because though there were many in that movement or are in that movement that have a lack of intellectual integrity, in other words, more causally driven than factually driven, there were those who were looking to go where the facts led. And so they have gradually bailed. There are a lot of scientists who are atheists who are now Christ followers and believers. Because good science doesn't support the concepts of a primordial pool, but an uncaused first cause. Aristotle called it the divine watchmaker. Well, I know who made that watch. His name is Jesus, okay? That's where I'm at with that. Yes, I actually really, I really do believe in Jesus. I'm not hating on anyone. I mean, the devil's a deceiver. Here's another takeaway for us. Faith is neither dependent on nor devoid of empirical evidence. One of the new atheists' most prominent recent voices was Ayan Hirsi Ali, and, and she just an incredible lady who fought for uh, the rights of women and what had literally has been much maligned and persecuted, even threatened by the Islamic uh, Middle Eastern world, at, which is where she is from. Just a beautiful, powerful human but a part of the New Atheist Movement. Until November of 2023, she wrote a beautiful article about her conversion to Christianity. Why? Because that's where the evidence took her. Now, my prayer for her is that she finds a real deal personal, tight and right relationship with the risen Christ. 
of Christianity. But we still have some stuff to work on, and I'm about to work on it. Alistair McGrath, the author of The Dawkins Delusion, which is a pretty punchy book. Most of you won't be interested in, that's okay. He said the, the decline of the new atheist particular brand of hyperbolic anti-religious fervor, and it is declining, does not necessarily signify a rise in religious faith or belief in God. And that's where we come in. Church, sons and daughters, family of faith, that's where we come in. We're called to lean in and lead the way to Jesus. That's us. We don't, we don't just show the way, we lead the way. Man, y'all got a pastor that majored in biology, not theology. Sorry, it is what it is. Don't worry, I took some theology too. And our assignment, again, just simplistically, to be with and like Jesus. And this man, you go back now, I quoted it a second ago. Now I'm going to put it on the screen for you. But the second half or portion of 1 Peter 3.15, always be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. You can win an argument and lose the impact or influence that the argument was meant to make. Don't do that. Don't undress someone and kick them in the street because you expose. Listen, love people in their relationship with Jesus. Respect their perspectives, but share the truth. That's doable, everybody. Because the word is, it is, the truth is, listen, it's pretty good stuff. Here's what I believe. I, I quoted on the stage a second ago from John chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. Verses 1 and 2 says, in the beginning, here's what I believe. In the beginning was the word. And it, and it wasn't even a written copy yet. It was, the lo, it was the living word, you understand. In the beginning was the word, Jesus. And the word was God. And the word was with God. The same was in the beginning with God. And all things were created by him and through him. And without him was not anything made. That was made. That's Jesus we're talking about right That's what I believe. I believe in Jesus like that. Genesis 1 and 1. And even, I mean, in the beginning, God created. That's what John was referring to. God created the heavens and the earth. The Spirit of God moved over the waters of the deep. You say, well, shouldn't we? Because over here, you know, we believe in the Trinity. We believe in the power and person of the Holy Spirit. Well, John 14, 26, Jesus himself said, The Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name. Whose name does he come in? His name? No, Jesus' name. The Holy Spirit. He will teach you all things and bring your remembrance to your remembrance all that I've said to you. So the Holy Spirit, don't worry about the names, everybody. Holy Spirit's in the house. And he's here to complete the work of Christ. The work of Jesus. That's why we evoke the name of Jesus, because it is in his authority, that, that is of authority that comes from the Father and Son, that we see the will and work of God done and accomplished. The reality is, even from the genesis of 8 to 8 church, it was Jesus. And if it wasn't Jesus, we weren't going to make it through four hurricanes, all kinds of crazy moves, and a pandemic. We were never going to make it. We had no chance. It had to be Jesus. No one was going to be conflicted or confused to take any credit. It was always going to be Jesus. And it's always been Jesus. And somebody walked by me this morning after response, and they said, this happens every time. And they were wiping tears out of their eyes, and I said, it's not my fault. <laughs> he did that to you. He squeezed your heart and made tears come out your eyes. That wasn't me. I'm right here with you, little sister. Man, I'm going to stop right now and show you a video from that first, like it, when we first started setting up, it's just a minute and a half time lapse, and I'm sure I won't manage not to talk over the top of it. But I want you all to watch this real quick. This is from Blair Elementary. Two 24-foot trailers full of boxes and chair carts. Some of you all remember when we didn't have those chair carts. That came like three weeks late. They were delayed in the order. It's hard to get 150 chairs in there with no carts. We did it, setting up a stage, taking a nasty lunch room. We were thankful for it too. Yeah, I don't. Am I y'all's way? I don't know where to stand. Yeah, yeah. And then Jesus kept showing up. The beginning. Yeah. Then you got to put it back. Remember that, Ricky, J. Will, mm -hmm. Lindsay? 
Matter of fact, you're like, hey, y'all got to go home now. <laughs> you're uh, going to have to leave because we're fishing up. Yeah. Isn't that cool? Isn't that cool? Yeah. 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 Ricky was our pop and drape pro. Yeah. This, this, this is my favorite part, though. Watch this. This is cool. That's the last thing we did every Sunday. We put their tables back. <laughs> and it's always been Jesus. Listen, at the end of it, this is what I really want to say, and a few of my favorite things, and I'm going to have to hustle, but Jesus, my favorite things about Jesus, number one, because at the end of it, I mean, I, I believe in the evidence that supports the fact that he is who he is, but in, it is my relationship with him that carries me in this life. My, one of my favorite things about Jesus is how he's with us. I just love how he's with us. The garden's greatest tragedy in, in many ways was that it broke fellowship with the Father. Remember how God used to walk in the garden with them? And then this is an important point to make too. God didn't hide from them. He hid from, or they hid from him. And that's what we do sometimes. Like he is, he is with us. And the word, John 1, 14, back to John 1, and the word, literally Jesus, the word, that same word in the beginning, that word became flesh and made his home, like literally dwelt among us and, and opened a door for us to see the, the glory of the Father. And I see him. I don't know if you see him, but I, that not just that he's present, but how he's present. That again, he's not the uncaused first cause. He's not the unmoved mover as some would think. He's not just the divine watchmaker. He's helping us keep time. You understand what I'm saying? Like he is right here with us. He's the one that defeats the giants. You understand what I'm saying? He, he, is, he is the one who parts the Red Sea. We all have had and will have Red Seas and un, um, immovable. He's the one who either moves the mountain or gets us over the top of it. You got some folks in this house this morning need to know that that God is with us here. You hear me? He is with us here. I wrote a whole book, like a 100-day countdown to Christmas, titled Emmanuel, God with us. Isaiah was right in Isaiah 7, 14 when he said, and you will call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Not distant. He didn't set it in motion and walk away. He is here always with us and for us, even when we are running from him. I'm impressed. I'm impressed with Jesus. He's the fourth man in the fire. You understand what I'm saying? Like, he's, he's when the enemy thinks he has got you bound and thrown into a fire, and then he's like, hold on now. Didn't we throw three men bound in the fiery furnace, and now there are four. Loose. Come on, somebody say loose. Loose. I mean, where were they going? If they didn't stand still and chat it up, they were like, Hey, hey, <laughs> they were loosed and walking around. And he's been the fourth man in my fire more times than I can count. And yours too, by the way. And often the fire we set on ourselves. Like we did it. We caused it. And he was still there. He was, there was another in the fire standing next to me. Right? That's Hillsong, right? There was another in the waters holding back the sea. Christy was worried about how high I started that song. <laughs> and should I ever need reminding of how I've been set free, there is a cross that bears the burden where another died for me. He's that God. He's that good. He's that Jesus. The presence of problems. You say, well, I've still got problems. Yeah, the presence of problems can never overpower the presence of Jesus. Hashtag, see the empty tomb. That looked like a dead end no one could get out of, and it was a dead end for us. Well, I said it a minute ago. Man, I mean, he even overcame death. Eternity, everybody. I don't know lately. I think this is a part of being 58, but I have friends Going to be with Jesus pretty consistently. You know, and some of them are a good little bit older than me, but it ain't that old. 
anymore. Help us, Lord. And, and my consistent, and they, they've been mostly God followers. So my consistent retort to the enemy, if he has any effort or attempt, makes any attempt to celebrate, is thank God for eternity. Sucker. You know what I'm saying? How do you see that? Give yourself completely to God. We're right back to 1 Peter 3.15. How do you see how he is with us? Because you may say, I don't see it. In your heart, revere Christ as Lord. Because the word tells us, Jesus himself said in Matthew 5.8, blessed are the pure in heart. How do you see God? Have a pure heart. Can you uh, choose enough piety to have a pure heart? No, you can't. You're going to need Jesus for that. But if you give yourself completely to him, he will purify and he will work. You won't, have to, uh, you won't have to act pure. You'll get to be pure. I've seen Jesus be extraordinary in the most ordinary places. A walk on the beach or a conversation with a child. A witness to a wanderer. In airplanes and checkout lines, on the job or on the sofa, in the hospital hallway. With a lady whose husband had a catastrophic stroke or a preemie. Our own son on the way to the neonatal ICU. I've seen Jesus in the ER with the dying in a ditch facing death myself. I have seen him in the boardroom. I have seen him in the oncology floor and in funeral goodbyes. I have seen Jesus consistently, faithfully, powerfully present and showing up. My favorite thing is how he's with us. And another, <laughs> I love how he's with us, I love how he sees us. Yes, I love how he sees us. Pardon me if I'm repeating myself, but I, I do. Like 1 Samuel, you know, 15, he looked, Samuel was confused about, can David be a king? And, and God just spoke to him and said, you look on the outside, I look on the inside. He don't see you like you see you. He sees something we can't see, man. So I am... Ron, and I have for a long time said I was where I'm from. So I would say I'm Ron. And I, and I mean, maybe the semantics in this don't communicate what I really believed, but I would say I'm Ron from Enola. And that's how I would define who I am. And I, I'm not I'm embarrassed about where I'm from. I'm from a small town in rural Arkansas, and Enola is literally alone spelled backwards. So I would joke when I would preach, and preaching all over the world. I would say I'm Ron from Enola which is alone spelled backwards, which is what you are if you're from Enola. You're pretty much alone in the world. Matter of fact, you're never going to run into anyone from Enola outside of Enola. <laughs> Except maybe at the Walmart in Conway, which was 20 miles away. And I would joke, my joke was, if you're looking for someone, go to Conway and wait, They'll or go to Walmart and wait, they'll be there in a minute. <laughs> and then Wilmington got three Walmarts. I wouldn't know where to wait. <laughs> and if you want to find me, you're going to need to go to Food Line. Because I'm the quick in and out guy. So it blew my joke up. But long before that, long before that, I was speaking at a church camp. Maybe it was big. It was hundreds of kids there. And it was a powerful week. And at one point I said that I'm Ron from Enola. And I, Karen and I's oldest son, Isaac, came to me and he said, you know, you always say that, Dad. And it's, it's funny. It's funny. But he said, I think you believe it. I think you think it defines you and what God can do with you. You're Ron from Enola. He said, you're actually from Enola. But you are a son on assignment from the king's house. That's who you are. And I said, uh, shut up. I'm the preacher at this freaking church camp. I don't Not true, man. I went, oh, he's right. And I wept, right? Because, it, and, and God sees us for we are his workmanship. And, and it, listen, let me interrupt myself. Whatever you've done, he still sees what you can be. He hasn't given up on your destiny. He, he can't. Even when we're not faithful, he is faithful. He never stops seeing who he made you to be. Some of you praying for somebody. Well, keep praying. Because he still sees the possibility of breakthrough because he's the one that gave it. We are created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. You see your regular failure. Jesus sees your road to redemption. You're over there saying, I fail all the time. He's saying, I got a road to redemption for you. You see your consistent struggle. Why well, always struggle? You see your consistent struggle. Jesus sees your willingness to fight and never give up. Thank you for staying in the fight. You see yourself as a chump. 
Challenged by brokenness, you think you may never overcome. Jesus sees you as a champion who wins not only for you, but for others. Come on now. Come on now. That's how he sees. I love the way he sees us. See what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called the children of God, so we are. The reason the world does not know, they won't see it that way, is because they don't know him. I, one of my favorite things about what makes him amazing, number three, is in how he loves us. Now that one's pretty obvious, right? Uh, I think the love of God is clearly the most powerful thing. It, it is his uh, most self-defining attribute. He is love. He doesn't just love, he is love, right? But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, trespasses made us alive together with Christ by grace, you have been saved the way that he loves us. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Every morning. This is how he loves us. Great is his faithfulness. And, and then this. This is incredible to me. Another takeaway for us. Jesus pursues us to love us. You understand? Like he literally runs us down. He pursues us to love us. We be like, uh -huh. Stop running, right? Run to, not from. Run to, not from. Somebody say it. Run to, not from. Run to God, not from God. That way you'll be apprehended by his love sooner. That'll be good. Close the gap, everybody. I've seen this in the most uh, forgotten places on the planet. There's a story I love to tell about my first trip. So we got our Africa team is just essentially has come together and we're getting ready to start our prep. You'll be hearing a lot more about that. We'll be going back to Western Zambia this year. And my first trip foray into church planting in the bush many years ago was a place called Nalilau. And I argued with the founder of the Zambia Project, who's a great friend to me. You'll, he'll be here preaching for us in April, actually. But I told him, I said, look, just let me stay at the base and work on your internet and stuff like that. You know, just you guys are better. You don't, you speak better through the translator. You've done that more. I'm going to be awkward. And he said, you have a destiny for ministry in the bush. Boy, was he right. You know, now so many trips and years later and leading teams and trips. But I was arguing and I went in there and even the first couple of days, I was missing my family. It's expensive to do. It was hard to do. I was thinking, God, why am I even here? And you walk and talk the gospel. So just think extremely real, real picture of Sub-Saharan Africa. And we're walking and we go to a unit of, uh, in a village where there may be eight or 10 of these huts with reed that makes the hut or mud stuff between sticks and there are logs and little chairs and people you come up and sit down maybe somebody's working on some milly mill or something like that and they'll go get people it takes a little while they'll gather a crowd you'll sit down and you'll share the gospel you know we're here to share with you the most important message in the history of history that anyone could ever share with anyone you know have you uh, heard about Jesus or Jesu Christi I don't think he's ever been through here you know whatever the responses are they vary and, but then we'd been doing that and it'd been tough. And then I walked up to this one area with, uh, there was only like three of us and a translator. And we walked up and there was just this one young guy, probably a teenager, and then an older dude that looked like Yule Brenner. That's only for the old people. But <laughs> before there was Denzel Washington, there was Yule Brenner. And just a great bald head and just stacked. Dude was just bowed up. And, and no one else. I mean, there was only like two huts. And we almost didn't even stop. Why even stop there? I remember thinking, let's just divert. This guy's busy. He had these remedial tools, and he was literally taking logs out of the bush and making furniture that he would carry 11 hours to the closest third world city to sell. I mean, that's how industrious he was. And, us, and trying to talk to him, you could tell we were bugging him. He was busy. He was trying to do work, and we were bugging him. And so I'm, I sit down I'm trying to talk to him, and he's just working. He won't even look up. So then my task is to try to get low enough so I can see his face. So I'm like, <laughs> trying to get down. <laughs> well, that got his attention. Because <laughs> that's weird, right? And, and I said, you know, I've been wondering, speaking through a translator, I've been wondering why God had me here. I feel like all the other people on this team are more equipped for this ministry. But I said, I know now, God sent me for you. I rode... I told him, I said, I rode, I had the kilometer conversion, but 8,000 miles on an airplane. I left my family. 
It was expensive. And I've questioned why I'm here now. I know. Because Jesus wants you to know that you're not forgotten, that you're seen, and that he loves you. And he wants a relationship with you. And then his eyes started to leak. Short version of a long story. He miraculously gave his heart to Jesus that day. Eula. Eula gave his heart to Jesus that day. And he became one of the pillars of the church that we would launch. Like at the end of our time there, the question was, who has had their heart changed by Jesus? And at first, no one was brave enough to stand up. Not because they didn't love God, but because culturally that was an awkward ask. Sheesh, some of you wouldn't stand up for me. You'd be like, uh, no, I love God, but you ain't making me. <laughs> and this quiet chair maker was the first to stand. He pursues us to love us. In Africa, sub-Saharan Africa, specifically speaking, third world, not first world. Their question isn't, is there God? It's, is he good? And does he love me? And the answer for you and for them is yes. So about three years ago, I got word from a mutual friend, a minister that side, and he said, hey, um, Eula, went to be with Jesus. I'm glad we didn't pass by that village. Come on, Carissa. At least make them think I'm almost done. <laughs> <laughs> the love of Jesus is the most obvious and consistent reality I've witnessed in this world. Your unfailing love, O oh Lord, is as vast as the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches beyond the clouds. You know, we talk about it like sometimes we like to say, Jesus loves you to, or I love you, we would say, sorry. I love you to the moon and back. Well, Jesus loves you way past the moon and back. Lastly, I love how he holds us. Jesus is amazing how or why? In how he holds us. Paul wrote in Colossians and said, through him, God, meaning Jesus, created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. He existed before anything else. And then get this, and he holds all creation together. She says, a kid, I was just impressed with the little song that said he has the whole world in his hand. You know what I'm saying? Like, you got the whole, I'm like, how does he spin it? You know? <laughs> how does he... It's not just the world. There was a Jesus rocker from the 70s who had a song, and then it, there was a lyric that said, and if there's life on other planets, because that was a big thing in the 70s. I don't know what we were doing. <laughs> I kind of do, but... If there's life on other planets, then I'm sure that he must know. And he's been there once already. And he died to save their souls. And the reality is Jesus holds everything in the universe and beyond together, including me and you. Isaiah 41.10, don't be afraid for I am with you. Don't be discouraged for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. This is him to you and to me. I will hold you up with my victorious right hand. Come on, worship team. They don't seem very convinced with Carissa up here, so we'll just... Okay. <laughs> the last time I saw my mom, my mom went to be with Jesus in 2020. That was a tough year, everybody, for a lot of people. And... Um, divisiveness robbed us of our compassion, which was sad, but I digress. But my mom, my dad wasn't really walking with God the majority of my uh, life. Came to Jesus more definitively late, and I believe he's with Jesus now. But my mom, man, she was a spiritual matriarch of our family and carried us to church and whatever, and most uh, directly influential person in my life toward God. And, but, back in Arkansas and on hospice at my sister's house. So I flew home in the week. I was gonna spend some time 
with her and I did, but on like that week, things this side started, there was just some things that I really felt like the Lord, there was some jeopardy, some vulnerabilities that were happening here. And I knew I needed to come back. My family, Karen and the guys were, and girls were gonna join us the next Monday, hoping to get some time with my mom before she went to be with Jesus. But I knew on this Tuesday, I changed my flight to fly home on Wednesday. And I knew likely it would be the last time I saw her alive. And that night, I was in a guest room at my sister's house. Thanks for being patient with me. I appreciate it. Thanks. And, and I, that night, though, I was just there, and I was thinking about Mary. I was thinking about saying bye to Mary, my mom, Mary. And I, all night long, I listened to a song by Zach Williams and Dolly Parton. <laughs> there was Jesus. And there he was. Listen, church family, I need you to know something. Oh, oh, oh. I'm a guy. <laughs> I'm an outdoorsy dude, okay? But I still need to be held sometimes. And especially by my Savior. We all do, man. And he doesn't just hold me. He holds me together. You know what I'm saying? Like, I didn't come apart. I knew the choice. The next day, when we spent a little bit of time with mom, and she hadn't spoken or been particularly coherent in two or three days, and when I was getting ready to leave, I was leaving the room knowing that if she could speak to the priority, she would agree with it. But it was still hard. It felt wrong to leave. And then as I'm getting ready to leave, I look back, and somehow she found a way to frame, or uh, focus her frame on me, to look deep into my heart. And I knew it was God, not mom saying, I've, I'm holding her. I love the way he holds us. Do you hear me? Whatever it is you're dealing with or going through, know this, where shall I go from your spirit or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to the heavens, you're there. If I make my bed in hell itself, Sheol, you are there. If I take wings, the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. We are never not held. If we lean into God, the truth about Jesus, who he is and how he loves is the most important truth that any human can ever know. Jesus with us and for us. He finds us and binds us. He holds us together with his love. He sees us and frees us. Never does he leave us. He heals us with power from above. No hope we have without him, never should we doubt him. His fingerprints are everywhere we look. And even when we wouldn't trust him, in fact, our choices surely hurt him, still he gave his life because that's what it took to forgive and to restore to a place that's better than before, now graced to come into the presence of the king. Nothing we did to earn such grace, it was his choice. He made the space, even when he knew we had no gift to bring. So now we give ourselves for others, just like Jesus, our big brother, praying they will see him in the love we show. May our journeys give him glory as he redeems our broken stories. So those who see will trust the Savior we now know. Yes, 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 yes. And upon this rock, I'll build my church. <laughs>